Boa noite a todas e todos. Para quem não me conhece, eu sou João Leonardo Medeiros e tenho a honra de mais uma vez conduzir a sessão de abertura desse evento. Agora não mais desde um auditório físico no campus do Graguatá, mas a partir do estúdio virtual Lérida Povoleri. É com muita felicidade que eu saúdo o público desse Coloque Internacional Marxismo Marxismo 2021, que vai discutir o tema O Futuro Exterminado, Crise Ecológica e Reação Anticapitalista. Eu quero iniciar agradecendo a todas e todos que nos assistem, mando aqui, é, de minha parte e da parte do Marx, o abraço que nós gostaríamos de dar presencialmente. Quero também agradecer e saudar de início a toda a equipe do NIEP, do NIEP Marx. A gente está organizando esse evento na raça, com poucos recursos, com muita criatividade e com muita disposição. Eu não vou nomear as inúmeras pessoas que trabalharam para que essa atividade é, pudesse acontecer esta semana e que venha acontecer na próxima semana, mas queria dizer que foram muitas pessoas, que foram pessoas variadas e que nós fizemos o melhor que nós podíamos na condição horrorosa em que nós temos trabalhado. Em nome do grupo, eu quero dizer que a gente se esforçou muito para fazer um evento com ótima qualidade. Já que eu falei de recursos, quero agradecer ao Conselho Regional de Economia do Rio de Janeiro, o Corecon RJ, que é o maior apoiador dessa iniciativa. O Corecon tem sido companheiro do NIEP desde que nós fizemos o primeiro... Meu irmão, ele suportou o Marx e o Marxismo no formato de colóquio em 2011, and they have always supported our, our events. And so we have great pride to preserve this great tie with the Economist Association. And I also will, I will have to mention another partnership, a long time per, per, partnership with Niep Marx, which is the simultaneous interpretation team of the multi-interpretation that uh, is the best of in terms of interpreters in Brazil. And I'd like to thank especially the interpreter Sergio and that has worked at all the editions of our seminars in these last 10 years. Some some people call it the NIEP Congress, other call it the Marx Colloquium. And I'd also like to thank for Giza Vasconcelos, the other interpreter that has also been working in our events for a long time. And I'd also like to thank Paulo that uh, developed the graphic part of the event that you just saw the small introduction, a visual introduction. And last but not the least, I would like to great, give a great hug in our colleagues here that accepted to speak in the very different panels and to Gustavo Gomes, Alexandre Costa, Andres Mão, uh, Sabrina Fernandes, João Pedro Stede and Virginia Fontes. And I left to, have the, to mention the last two main speakers of this opening session. They are two professors and researchers of great quality that certainly will give us a great panel. John Bellamy Foster from the University of Oregon in the US and editor of the historic magazine Monthly Review and Eduardo Sabarreto, one of the reasons for us to be very proud of a NIEP Marx. And with that, I'm sure that our guests will develop a great panel and as it will be with all the other panels in this colloquium. Um, I trust that, that this will happen. But we're not going to have easy discussions here. This event does not deal with a theme that we should celebrate. Or it doesn't mean that we uh, will discuss a good memory or to show a future and prosperous and comfortable future. No, uh, to be blunt, we're going to deal with an issue that we cannot anymore bypass the threat of annihilation of human life in, on Earth. And what we know and certainly will be stressed here is that this is not a natural exclusive phenomenon and that it cannot be solved merely by chance, by random or by spontaneous transformation of nature. The anthropogenic nature or character of the process has to do with its causes and it's with a surmount and which is more and more difficult and full of sequelae. Today, it's more than evident that we're going to face uh, uh, prone to fork, not between socialism and barbarism that was decided by the victory of barbarism, but between uh, a fork between socialism and the annihilation. I don't want to scare the, our 
participants in this opening, but I want to be very blunt about what we have to expect of a problem of this magnitude. It will be our generation to decide the luck and fortune of the human species. This will demand from us a lot of intellectual training, a lot of ideological conviction, and an ethic, strong commitment, and a praxis that will express all that. Unavoidably, it will be the socialist to be the vanguard in the fight to preserve the human life, to be a protagonist that socialism always had in all the humanizing achievements that were reached during the period of capitalist production. So what can I expect in the opening of this event is that we can really face this challenge that we have ahead. So I'd like to thank you all. And I would like to give the floor immediately to Bellamy Foster that will make his first presentation. But before that, I would like to say that this event with simultaneous interpretation and the participants can make an option with the language. You can click in the small globe at the end of your screen and choose the language that you wish to follow. For those that participate here in the room, in the Zoom room, and those that are following the YouTube, they can make your questions, but these questions should be directed by email. And now he's just you know, giving the email address. And so he's now repeating the email address for both people that wish to direct their questions. Having said that, I now would like to give the floor to uh, Professor Foster and to thank him very much for accepting our invitation to be part of this colloquium. You have the floor, sir. Hello. Um, my talk is uh, entitled e Ecology and the Future of History revolution or destruction. It's great pleasure to be speaking at the 2021 Nia Marx Conference on the question of the exterminated future, uh, ecological crisis and anti-capitalist reason. The issues that bring us together on this occasion, however, are ominous ones. Around a week ago on August 9th, Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, responding to the new climate change report of the Intergovernmental Pan uh, Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations, declared that it is code red for humanity. The, to, to quote him, the alarm bells are deafening and the evidence is irrefutable. Greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning and deforestation are choking our planet and putting billions of people at immediate risk. Global heating is affecting every region on Earth, with many of the changes ir becoming irreversible. Uh, moreover, uh, it is not just global war warming that poses catastrophic threats to humanity today. Nearly all of the planetary boundaries ascertained by science defining a safe space for humanity within the Earth system are in the process of being crossed. This includes beyond climate change, ocean acidification, loss of genetic diversity, and the extinction of species. We call it the sixth, sixth extinction destruction of nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, loss of ground cover, including forests, desertification, chemical pollution, radiation, and other threats to the Earth's stability and to human survival. More recently, we have seen the reemergence re of a global pandemic in the form of COVID-19. Economic and financial crisis, imperialism, a new Cold War, and the growth of fascism are all taking place in our times. The common denominator, indeed the cause of all of these developments is the capitalist system and it's a pursuit of accumulation of capital at the expense of people on the planet. Karl Marx as far back as the 1860s wrote of ruin or revolution in the case of the ecological crisis facing Ireland as a result of British colonialism. Later, he observed 
civilization leaves deserts behind it. In the 1970s, the French Marxist theorist Henri Lefebvre, viewing the emerging planetary ecological crisis, spoke of revolution or destruction. In the 1980s, the English historian E.P. Thompson introduced in his Notes on Exterminism, the last stage of capitalism, an argument explaining how the system pointed toward ecological destruction, either through thermal nuclear war via nuclear winter, which would have the effect of a sudden reduction in global temperature by several degrees or several tens of degrees, or more slowly through global ecological destruction. As German ecologist Rudolf Barrow summed up the Marxian critique, to express the exterminism thesis in Marxian terms, one could say that the relationship between productive and destructive forces is turned upside down. Like others who look at civilization as a whole, Marx had seen the trail of blood running through it, what he referred to as the destructive or negative side of capitalist development. This is a, a theme that I, I developed in my Ecological Revolution, my book Ecological Revolution in 2009 as well. Knowing all of this, though, and seeing the earth literally on fire, world society as a whole has nonetheless been unable to act. The reason is that we are led to believe that we are living in a Greek tragedy where people are caught in an inexorable fate based on the illusion that there is no exit from the present system. The gods of capital, we are told, are all powerful and their rule is endless, even if it takes us all the way to Hades. Indeed, nothing so clearly demonstrates the inherent limits of capitalist ideology as its innate denial of the future of history. The capitalist meta metaphysic, as Jean-Paul Sartre critically observed, is one of a barred future. There is no exit from the system and its burning house. Even in the context of the present planetary emergency brought on by capital accumulation, Margaret Thatcher's well-known mantra, there is no alternative to the regime of capital, a view that she repeated so frequently that she was nicknamed Tina, continues to ex exercise its frozen grip on society. The notion of bourgeois society as the end or culmination of history intrinsic to liberal thought found its most powerful concrete expression in the early 19th century writings of George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. In recent years, however, credit for the questionable notion that capitalism marks the termination of the historical process has been accorded to Francis Fukuyama based on his 1992 book, The End of History and the Last Man. In advancing the thesis of a, quote, universal and directional history leading to liberal democracy, and stopping there, Fukuyama, who served as deputy director of policy planning and as deputy director of European political military affairs in the U.S. State Department during the George H.W. Bush administration, was merely repackaging long-standing claims of liberal ideology in the context of the demise of the Soviet Union, which he took as representing the final defeat of socialism and the ultimate victory of capitalism, closing off history in any meaningful sense. Humanity, according to this hegemonic view, widely circulated in the 1990s and up to today, had reached its political, economic, ideological apex. There was no future beyond capitalism and liberalism. Yet a mere quarter century after the celebration of the end of history and the triumph of capitalism in the permanence of the liberal order, humanity is confronted with a chain of catastrophic threats extending beyond anything it has experienced in the long course of its development, all arising from the laws of motion of capitalism. In the present epical crisis, there are multiple dire threats to the world as a whole and to the wretched of the earth in particular, from economic stagnation in the capitalist core to planetary, to the planetary ecological rift, 
to the epidemiological threat represented by COVID-19, to the renewed imperialism directed at the global south and the new Cold War on China. All rational responses to this age of threatened catastrophe point to the need for a global transformation aimed at surmounting capitalism's laws of motion and promoting a world, sustainable, a world of sustainable human development, that is uh, socialism and ecology. As Marx indicated in the 19th century, in, the, in those cases where capitalism leads to the ecological, ecological destruction of entire social formations and the extermination of the material basis of, of human existence, the choice left to the working populations and their communities inevitably becomes one of ruin or revolution. Historically, uh, revolutions have appeared globally in waves. The first stirrings of what can be conceived as a new revolutionary wave, different than the ones that came before, but emanating primarily from the global south, are now um, are now arising in response to capitalism and the Anthropocene. This will likely expand rapidly with the decline of U.S. world hegemony related to the rise of China. 21st century revolutionary praxis necessarily operates within a wider field, combining the struggles for socialism and ecology. It represents a new materiality of hope rooted in the movements of hundreds of millions, potentially billions of people seeking to trans transcend the oppressions of class, race, gender, environmental just injustice, and imperialism emanating from the empire of capital. These struggles necessarily entail new revolutionary vernaculars arising in specific historical and cultural contexts, embodying environmental as well as economic realities. In this sense, there's not a single model of proletarian revolution. Rather, today's movements towards socialism and ecology encompass peasant and indigenous struggles while converging in complex ways with the struggles of a still expanding industrial and post-industrial working class confronting a rapidly changing environment engendered by capitalism's creative destruction. In all such instances, it is the combined materiality of the economy and the environment that now determines the, the terrain of resistance and revolt. Struggles that begin from an ecological basis, the most, most inclusive element of the material conditions shaping people's lives are as vital as economic struggles and it's crucial to, in the end, def to uh, defining the class structure of society. Genuine revolutionary movements necessarily combine the two, shaping the nature and culture of social agency in our time. Today, the catastrophes unleashed by capitalism embrace not only economy, but the entire environment of the planet, leading to the emergence everywhere of what can be called an environmental proletariat. In the Grundrisse, written in 1857-1858, Marx famously described capital as a limitless drive to accumulate that accepted no boundaries outside of itself. Drawing on Hegel's dialectic of barriers and boundaries in which barriers were understood as something to be surmounted, in contrast to boundaries which represented actual limits, Marx declared, capital is the endless and limitless drive to go beyond its limiting boundaries, bar its limiting barriers. Every boundary is and has to be a barrier for it, else it would cease to be capital. If ever it perceived a certain boundary, uh, not as a barrier that could be surmounted, but became comfortable with it as a boundary, it would itself have declined from exchange value to use value from the general abstract form of wealth to a specific substantial form of the same. Capital drives beyond national barriers and prejudices as much as beyond nature worship, as well as all traditional combined complacent encrusted satisfactions of present needs and reproductions of old ways of life. It is destructive towards all of this and constantly revolutionizes it, tearing down all barriers which hem in the development of the forces of production. But from the fact that capital posits every such limit as a barrier and hence gets ideally beyond it, it does, does not by any means follow that it has really overcome it. 
And since every barrier contradicts its character, its production moves in contradictions which are constantly overcome, but just as constantly posited. I know this is, um, is uh, complex and abstract, but it's extremely important. The constant positing of contradictions that are only ideally surmounted, which, but which nonetheless remain and accumulate over the course of capitalism to the point that the more potentially that more potentially catastrophic crises emerge has to do with the fact that capital's creative destruction revolutionizes the world in ways that are limited by its own essential conditions of existence. The one boundary that is permanent, which can never be transgressed from the standpoint of capital, is the social relation of cap class-based accumulation itself. And thus it is to this artificially imposed boundary that all the contradictions of the system can ultimately, ultimately be traced. The true barrier boundary to capitalist production, Marx wrote, is capital itself. The concrete result of this central contradiction of the capitalist system is that all transformations carried out by capital as part of its process of creative destruction are necessarily associated with fetters on sustainable human development in the form of alienated second order mediations leading to ever more contradictory and catastrophic results. The path to a world of sustainable human development is blocked at every point. It is this limit determined by the very nature of the system that now constitutes the fundamental basis of the planetary ecological and economic crisis engulfing the entire world, world seemingly closing off the future of history. The more serious the social and economic and ecological contradictions become, the more the ideological response is to seal capitalism off from history, defining it as an immutable reality and denying all other possibilities. The universalization of the present in such a way as to portray the ruling ideas of society, which are at the same time both the ideas of the ruling class and the ideological bases of its rule, is common to all ruling classes, whether in the form of the divine right of kings or the invisible hand of capital. Such universalization, however, becomes more complex in those societies in which the reality of historical development is recognized. Here, what is above all required is the denial of the future through the decapitation of history, as Sartre called it. The decapitation of history is evident in the ubiquitous attempts of both mainstream modernist and postmodernist ideology to deny the historical specificity and thus the transitory character of capitalist social relations. Just as any future beyond capitalism is denied, so is capitalism's genesis presented in the conventional wisdom as predetermined, a mirror coming to be of forces that were always present and simply waiting to be let free. The result is the systematic denial of any coherent theory of the historical origins of capitalism, which would contradict its innate character. As Marxian political theorist Ellen Mason's Wood observed, accounts of the origin of capitalism are fundamentally circular, assuming the prior existence of capitalism in order to explain its coming into being. Capitalism seems to always be there somewhere, and it only needs to be released from its chains, for instance, from the fetters of feudalism to be allowed to grow and mature. The notion that capitalism is a natural and universal and thus so somehow ever-present reality, only waiting for obstacles to be cleared away to its advance for it to emerge full bloom can be traced to the liberal possessive individualist view of human nature associated with thinkers from Thomas Hobbes to Adam Smith, the latter stipulating as the basis of his economic vision an inherent tendencies, tendency of human beings to truck, barter, and exchange. In this view, which remains dominant in present-day ideology, capitalism is simply bourgeois human nature parading as human nature in general, writ large. Max Weber in the 20th century was to expand on this fundamental fundamental bourgeois outlook by presenting capitalism as, quote, the most fate 
fateful force in our modern life, constituting the highest development of the formally rational instrumentalist culture that was uniquely identified in Weber's Eurocentric perspective with the West. Quote, in Western civilization and in Western civilization only, he wrote, were to be found cultural phenomena, which as we like to think, lie in a line of development having universal significance and value. What he was saying is that uh, there are many cultures in the world, um, many particular cultures, but the only universal culture is Western culture based on, on Western rationalism, the high, highest form of which is capitalism. The naturalization of fundamental capitalist relations of production is deeply embedded, embedded within neoclassical economics, where historical elements hardly enter at all. In the prevailing reductionist view in the dismal science, the same abstract factors of production associated with capital are seen as common to absolutely all societies. Society is seen by conventional economists primarily in a positivistic mode in terms of invariant laws of which the market in capitalism is the supreme expression. In this view, all historical laws associated with particular social systems as historically specific emergent forms of organization with their own properties are deemed false. All developments are in effect predetermined by universal innate unchanging properties with capitalist modernity implicitly representing the ultimate working out of these fundamental principles. Aligned with this general historical perspective, technology is often treated today as if it were innately capitalist based on Joseph Schumpeter's famous notion of creative destruction, which was derived from Marx's concept of capitalism as a revolutionary technological force. The, the effect of this in current discussions has been to reinforce the belief in the mutability of capitalism with, with widespread notions of technological determinism, designating all progress as somehow uniquely capitalist and predestined. In the face of climate change, it is generally assumed in the prevailing outlook that all solutions to the most pressing social problems are technological and all technologies that might, technologies that might conceivably address the, the dire challenges we face are compatible with capitalism. Central to the denial of histor historicity of both past and present related to the prevailing notions of economic and technological determinism is the almost complete identification of capitalism with modernity. As sociologist Peter L. Berger put it in Capitalism and the Disorder of Modernity, quote, capitalism is a thoroughly modern phenomenon, perhaps even the most modern phenomenon of all. The main alternative to capitalism in terms of modernity Modernity was seen as the Soviet type economies, but with their demise and the triumph of capitalism, there was seemingly no alternative to capitalism in the context of modernity. Indeed, many leftists who themselves came to accept the end of history began to see capitalism itself in terms of post-modernity in which the future had been decapitated, emphasizing how capital and technological imperatives annihilated all grand meta historical projects. For cultural critic Leo uh, Marx, rejecting this trend, the pessimistic tenor of postmodernism follows from this inevitably diminished sense of human agency. Here the battle with capitalist modernity is reduced to a shadowy postmodern exercise limited to the cultural in interstices of the system rather than a genuine emancipatory project. This, this perspective thus becomes one of disenchantment and de-enlightenment, a stance of perpetual of somewhat detached and ironic defeat. As Wood wrote in the final analysis, postmodernity for postmodernist intellectuals seems to be not a historical moment, but the human condition itself from which there is no escape. The belief that capitalism constitutes the ultimate boundary to human existence is so embedded in today's dominant ideology that as Derek Jensen and Eric, and Eric McVeigh wrote in What We Leave Behind, it gives rise to a cultural outlook in which there is an inversion of the real and the not real, where dying oceans and dioxin in every mother's breast milk are considered less real than industrial capitalism. 
Hence, we are constantly led to believe that the end of the world is less to be feared than the end of industrial capitalism. When most people in this culture ask, how can we stop global warming? That's not really what they are asking. They're asking, how can we stop global warming without significantly changing this lifestyle or death style, as some call it, that is causing global warming in the first place? The answer is that you can't. It, it's a stupid, absurd, and insane question. It is this same ruling ideological view that Frederick Jameson was to capture in his famous aside. Someone once said that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And nothing indeed so clearly caps, captures the capitalist universalism parading as realism that dominates contemporary ideology, closing off the future as history, even in the face of uh, the threatened destruction of all of humanity. Confronted with the received ideology of a barred future, which denied the continuing role of revolution in human history, Sartre passionately declared, even a barred future is still a future. This adamant refusal to accept capitalism as a boundary that could never be crossed drew its essential meaning not simply from an abstract conception of human agency, but also from the fact that we live, as he said, in, quote, a time of incredible revolutions. The incredible revolutions emerging in our time are, as in previous historical eras, aimed at the ever wider social control of the means of production. Yet, unlike some previous class struggles and revolutionary movements, this is no longer conceived today mainly in narrow economic terms, but also increasingly in ecological terms, reflecting the fact that it is the social metabolism between human beings and nature that constitutes the most ineluctable basis of human history. The agent of revolution is increasingly a working class that is not conceived in its usual sense as a purely economic force, but as an environmental cultural force, an environmental proletariat. From a historical materialist perspective, this should hardly surprise us. Most of the major class struggles and revolutionary movements over the centuries of capitalist expansion have been animated in part by what could be called ecological imperatives, such as struggles over land, food, and environmental conditions, going beyond narrower political economic objectives. The English Revolution and the French Revolutions of the 17th and 18th centuries, respectively, each involved intense struggles over land ownership, represented by the diggers and the levelers in the former and the great peasant revolt in the latter. E.P. Thompson concluded his great work, The Making of the English Working Class, by indicating that no one else after William Blake was fully at home in both cultures of revolt against acquisitive man, that of the romantic criticism of utilitarianism rooted in struggles over the land, aesthetics, and the environment, and that of industrial workers fighting capital. It was the separation of these two great movements, he suggested, that led in the end to a working class struggle that gravitated toward a mere resistance movement than a, rather than a revolutionary challenge to capitalism. Yet it would be wrong to see this separation as ever having been absolute. If the romantics started with a struggle over land and nature, they nevertheless, through radical figures like Shelley, Ruskin, and Morris, provided devastating critiques of bourgeois political economy, over, often overlapping with the industrial working class. The English proletariat in the 19th century fought an environmental struggle that was no less serious due to capitalism's total separation of workers from the land and the annihilation of, liable, of a livable environment for those laboring in the industrial cities. <clears throat> uh, this is, um, is captured in Frederick Engels' account of social murder in Manchester and other in English factory towns in 1844. 
in which he focused um, especially on the environmental conditions of the working class. Marx, partly inspired by Engels, wrote in 1844, even the need for fresh air ceases to be a need for the worker. Man reverts once more to living in a cave, cave but the cave is now polluted by the mephitic and pestilential breath of civilization. Moreover, the worker has no more than a precarious right to live in it, for it is for him an alien power that can be daily withdrawn uh, and from which, and, and from which um, should he fail to pay, he can be ev evicted at any time. He actually has to pay for this mortuary. A dwelling in the light, which Prometheus describes in Aeschylus as one of the great gifts through which he transformed savages into men, ceases to exist for the worker. Light, air, etc., the simplest animal cleanliness ceases to be a need for man. Dirt, this pollution and putrefaction of man, the sewage, this word to be understood in its literal sense of civilization, becomes an element of life for him. Universal neglect, putrefied nature becomes an element of life for him. The proletariat was conceived by Marx as stripped of all direct connections to the means of produ production, notably the land and natural resources, as well as tools, factories, and machinery, on which all human existence depended. It was thereby forced into struggles over capitalism's one-sided destruction of the conditions of life and the environment, and compelled ultimately to enter into battle over the entirety of the human social metabolism of nature. The living conditions of the proletariat, Marx wrote in The Holy Family, represent the focal point of all inhuman conditions in contemporary society. It cannot emancipate itself without abolishing the conditions which give it life, and it cannot abolish these conditions with abol without abolishing all those in human conditions of social life today, which are summed up in its own situation. The question of materialism for classical historical materialism was therefore both about what Marx called the universal metabolism of nature and about the mode of production or social metabolism in a given historical case. The latter viewed as an, an emergent form of nature with its own properties. In this way, the materialist conception of nature developed by natural science and the materialist conception of history of scientific socialism were seen as dialectically connected. In Marx's analysis, the labor and production process was itself defined as the social metabolism of humanity and nature. Production was both a social relation between human beings and a social ecological relation between human beings and nature. If economic crisis under capitalism were represented breaks in the accumulation of capital, ecological crises took the form of ruptures in the social metabolism, such as, quote, the internal natural conditions of this metabolism were undermined, as explained in Marx's famous theory of the metabolic rift. In such a perspective, militant class struggles and revolutionary movements were engendered by, con by contradictions that arose in the social metabolism of humanity and nature in both of its material aspects, political, economic, and natural environmental. Revolutionary movements did not simply emerge because of fetters on the expansion of production, what could be seen as mere economic causes, but also as a result of the destruction of people's actual living conditions and the natural conditions of production itself. In the former case, the potential of human development was undermined. In the latter, at least in the more dire instances, as in Ireland, in the mid-19th century, it became a case of what Marx and Engels called exterminism in both of the traditional senses of extirpation and exclusion. It is this complex understanding of the struggle for land nature environment, which was crucial to have historical, classical historical materialism, that explains why Marx and Engels, while emphasizing the role of the proletariat as the leading revolutionary force in developed capitalist economies, never denied either the past or present significance of present revolts in the struggle against bourgeois society, an approach that was extended to their growing support from the late 1850s on for all indigenous struggles against colonialism. Thus, classical historical materialism is distinct from some socialist tendencies 
never portrayed the, the peasantry as simply a reactionary class. The very issue of proletarianization in the age of so-called primitive accumulation or the age of the, the original expropriation was connected to the enclosure of the commons and the overthrow of the customary rights of the workers. For, for Marx, this could not be explained in terms of the kind of economic determinism or, uh, or notions of superior productivity of capitalism to which it was uh, attributed in the dominant ideology, but rather was the, a product of the opportunity that makes the thief the populace was fully justified in defending their rights to the commons, that is their communal property rights. Indeed, the proletarian struggle pointed ultimately to what Marx called the negation of the negation, the expropriation of the expropriators. In the classical historical materialist view, few things were more important than the abolition of the big land monopolies that divorce the majority of humankind from a direct relation to nature the land as a means of production, and a communal relation to the earth. Marx delighted in quoting Herbert Spencer's chapter from his Social Statics on the right to the use of the earth, where the latter stated, equity does not permit property and land, or the rest would live on the earth in sufferance only. It is impossible to discover any mode in which land can become private property. A claim to the exclusive possession of the soil involves land-owning despotism. Land, Spencer declared and Marx underscored, properly belongs to the great corporate body, society. Human beings were, quote, co-heirs to the earth. The recognition that struggles over the land and peasant wars were integral to the resistance cap to capitalism can be seen in Marx's statement in an 1856 letter to Engels that, quote, the whole thing in Germany will depend on whether it is possible to back the proletarian revolution by some second edition of the, of the peasants' war. That is through a struggle in which the urban proletariat and the rural pe peasantry, agricultural laborers, were both engaged, constituting a battle for both the cities and the land. In this view, Marx was building on the implications of Engels' 1850, the peasant war in Germany, in the context of the rise of revolutionary movements in Russia in the 1870s and 80s, Marx, at the end of his life, life placed a heavy emphasis on the archaic Russian commune and sided with the Russian revolutionary populace in seeing the peasantry who were concerned above all with defending their customary collective relations to the land is playing a crucial role in the coming Russian revolution. In this same perspective, focusing on the needs of all direct producers throughout the globe for collective control of their own means of production, thus opposing the expropriation of lands and bodies that led to Marx, led to Marx and Engels' strong attacks beginning in the late 1850s on colonialism and the defense of the revolts of indigenous people throughout the world. In particular, they supported indigenous revolts against expropriation and extermination in Ireland, India, China, Algeria, South Africa, and the Americas. With respect to the East Indies, Marx wrote, everyone but Sir Henry Maine and others of his ilk realizes that the suppression of communal land ownership out there was nothing but an act of English vandalism pushing the native people not forwards, but backwards. Likewise, criticizing the destruction by the British of the irrigation system of India and the famines leading to the deaths of millions of people, Marx pointed directly to the devastating effects of Western ecological imperialism. Such a viewpoint anticipated the numerous peasant and proletarian-led peasant wars of the 20th century most of these Marxist-inspired revolutions, including those of Mexico, Russia, China, Vietnam, Algeria, and Cuba, all of which rose in the context of resistance to imperialism and all involved intense struggles over the land and the environment, as well as uh, struggles of nascent proletariats. In general, third world movements have been named at both the environment and the economy and have been struggles in which peasants and indigenous people 
peoples have played central roles together with nascent proletarian and petty bourgeois forces. Often these wars of resistance and revolution have been waged by alliances between a proletariat and peasantry jointly resisting imperialism, fighting for peace, bread and land, not of course without contradictions. For the great African Marxist liberation fighter, Amilcar Cabral, the basis of revolutionary action in a colonial encounter required in part a return to the source of indigenous culture associated with a given population's historical relations to the material environment. If capitalism begins with the extensive external expropriation of lands and bodies, it then uses this as the basis from which it constructs a system of intensive internal exploitation of human labor. It is this dual process of expropriation and exploitation in which capitalist private property exhausts the environmental conditions of production and life, seeking, seeking to externalize this destruction onto the wider social and ecological realms as, on a global basis. It follows that as capitalism proceeds with its accumulation on an increasingly global basis, its de destruction simply knows no barriers extending to the world environment as a whole. In the German ideology, Marx and Engels captured this it's increasingly one-sided, yet all-encompassing, destructive character of capitalist production. And listen to this carefully, because this was an earlier version of the famous paragraph that you are also familiar with in relation to the preface of the Critique of Political Economy in 1859. This is from the German ideology. In the development of productive forces, there comes a stage when productive forces and means of the intercourse are brought into being which under existing relations only cause mischief and are no longer productive but destructive forces. These productive forces receive under the system of private property a one-sided development only, and for the majority they become destructive forces. Moreover, a great many of these forces can find no application at all within the system of private property. Labor and production now diverge to such an extent that material life appears as the end, and what produces this material life, labor as the means. Thus things have now come to such a pass that individuals must appropriate the existing totality of productive forces, not only to achieve self-activity, but also to merely safeguard their own existence. It was in fact that the perception of what he called the negative, that is destructive side of capitalist production, that Marx sought to capture in his theory of metabolic rift. His analysis here focused initially on the rift in the soil metabolism associated with the export of soil nutrients with the food and fiber sent to the new and densely populated urban areas. Uh, this contributed to the pollution of the cities together with the loss of soil fertility in rural areas. Similar rifts or ruptures in the social metabolism between Humanity and nature, Marx recognized, were common to capitalism's entire expropriation of nature and materialized in innumerable ways, not, not least of all, as he pointed out, in periodic epidemics. Uh, this was, was uh, described at great length, in fact, in, in, in Engels's condition of the English working class, which, which focused uh, primarily on the epidemiological crises and the threats to human existence uh, and the etiology of disease in the context of capitalism in 1844. And um, so today uh, we are faced with a planetary ecological crisis with environmental hazards everywhere, extending from climate change to ocean acidification to the sixth extinction to the destruction of phosphorus and nitrogen cycles, to deforestation and loss of ground cover, to desertification, to ubiquitous pollution by synthetic chemical and radioactive waste, to pandemics, to the destruction of the soil metabolism. The destructive influences are now part of our daily lives, from heat waves to megastorms to rising sea levels to COVID-19 and other pandemics. Marx's original notion of the degradation of the soil and uh, the social metabolic rift has now 
is now being utilized to explain the contradictions of the Anthropocene. That is, as scientists themselves, as natural scientists, um, are saying, the um, uh, the uh, the the dis disruption, um, the rifts in the biogeochemical cycles of the Earth caused by um, the uh, the human economy, now, namely capitalism. So once again, we're faced with the issue of of ruin and revolution. We'll need to we need to return to the source um, ecologically and culturally. And, and develop that in, in the context of our times, in, in the context of a, a workable revolutionary future. In terms of uh, the new eco-revolutionary wave and, and what I'm calling the environmental proletariat, we are seeing uh, this uh, foreshadowed in various movements in the world today that uh, are both workers' movements and environmental movements, such as the landless workers movement in MST in Brazil, the International Peasants Alliance, La Via Campesina, Venezuela's nascent besieged communal state, Cuba's revolutionary ecology and epidemiology, the resource nationalist and post-colonialist movements in Africa, the farmers' revolt in India, China's goal of a socialist-based ecological civilization and its rural-based, um, its rural reform movement, the student-led climate strikes in Europe, the Green New Deal, Red New Deal, just transition, environmental justice and Black Lives Matter struggles in the United States and Canada, and the revival on every inhabited content, continent of indigenous environmental struggles. I will, um, I've gone a little over time, I will end with, um, Simple, um, a, a quote uh, from Nick Estes um, from his book, Our History is the Future, Standing Rock versus the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, talking about indigenous resistance. Indigenous people must lead the way. Our history and long traditions of indigenous resistance provide possibilities for futures premised on justice. After all, indigenous resistance is animated by ancestors' refusal to be forgotten and it is our re resolute refusal to forget our ancestors and our history that animates our vision for liberation. Indigenous revolutionaries are the ancestors from the before and, and before and the already forthcoming. There is a capaciousness to indigenous kinship that goes beyond the human, whereas past revolutionary struggles have strived for emancipation of labor from capital, we are challenged not just to imagine, but to demand the emancipation of the earth from capital. For the earth to live, capitalism must die. Uh, so we need to create a movement of the wretched of the earth that's both ecological, environmental, uh, that is uh, both irresistible and, ir and uh, irreversible. We need to do this, it may seem utopian, but the word utopian no longer applies since this is a question of the survival of humanity, uh, which only socialism and ecology can provide. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm going to um, speak in Portuguese, so I'll go back to the other language and the translators will move with me. not uh, an event that we are present physically at the end we cannot give you a hug in the Brazilian way and uh, to get to know our hospitality that we have here uh, in our group but please feel comfortable as you if you were here physically present amongst us and now I'd like to call Eduardo to start his presentation but before that I'd like to make some announcements first of all I would like to remind you all that the questions for this panel should be forwarded by email.
getting being better known. I personally had many opportunities that I've had to speak in public. I have emphasized the core of this critique, ecological and Marxist critique to capitalism. And this generates around discussions about production, the scale of production, consumption, uh, market consum consumption, etc. Many things that are approached by the Marxist ecology. And I've been also studying uh, these issues, these matters. This theoretical critique, it allows us to demonstrate with a certain, with a reasonable degree of accuracy, the unfeasibility of capitalism. And from there on, one, this uh, allows us to reject in a certain way some ideas that are current ideas in the mainstream that I will use uh, uh, green capitalism generically to name it. So we have already, we can reject that idea that the companies spontaneously will make a greener our system and moved by their own interests with new interests of coming from the consumers and and, and that will allow us to dispose certain ideas that a certain popular or people's pressure could push the companies, the big corporations to become greener. And it also allows us to reject that notion that is very in the, much in the mainstream that if everyone does your own share in some way or the other, it's the accumulation of each one doing their share, uh, we will move to a different world. But I just didn't want to stay in this realm going beyond these concepts that are easily for us, easy for us to reject, there's some others that are not easy to reject because they're seductive. And because they are seductive, sometimes they move around in the midst of our critical field. And here, around these ideas, or three ideas mainly, I organized my speech. My talk, the first one is the notion that in some way or the other, we could be capable of to exercise a, a consciousness control of the sphere of production and consumption within the realm of capitalism. That's the first thesis. And so when I discuss this, I'm going to split this, I, this concept in two. The second concept or second idea has to do with the inequality between nations and the structure between or center and periphery. And what would happen to per, the periphery if there was a major movement would be necessary to mitigate uh, the activities in terms of our in material impact on the planet. And the third idea, the third concept that I'll discuss in my talk is a proposal that is very fashionable amongst us that is not very much emblematic, but I'm sure show, show where are the issues is the idea of energy transition. And so, so the rest of my talk will be structured around these three issues that I just mentioned. So let's start from the beginning. Let's talk about the, the uh, conscious uh, control uh, over production and consumption. I said that I would split that into parts. The first part is that has to do I don't see Marxists, in fact, uh, spreading this idea, but in the left, in a broader sense of the left, I have perceived in some debates this kind of idea me uh, advance. It's a good growth, as they call it. This would be considered a qualitative growth. And what is implied there? What is implied is the expectation that we could uh, stimulate activities that are related to the quality of life and activities of low impact and at the same time where we can push for the decline or diminishing or and, and fading out of activities that are considered harmful uh, to the environment. And this has been re being re 
He said, as the economy of care, uh, uh, and so there's already an, a, a problem with this idea that it is necessary to grow, the idea of growth. This is already an idea that admits the obsession of growth that is very typical of capitalist society. And uh, departing from this idea, we seek an alternative for growth. And this suggests that this growth could be obtained uh, with the uh, growth of the so-called economy of care. And I can see a problem in the very beginning to imagine that the scale of growth of this economy of care would be in some way or the other capable to offset all the decline that would be provoked by the contraction and possible extinction of activities of high impact. Let's imagine that we would continue to be possible to obtain growth and a good growth, as it would be called, ending all the oil industry, gas and coal industry, mining industry, heavy duty industries, and so on. So already there's a, a illusion in terms in quantitative terms. And also beyond that, and even more important, there's a, an illusion from the systemic viewpoint to imagine that it would be possible and this is a conservative concept, that it would be possible to operate a transformation like this one within the framework of the capitalist society. That it would be possible in some way or the other uh, capitalism operating with a, a, a industry that would generate energy that would be not hostile with and uh, and and uh, and heavy industries and so on and so forth they would co exist so this is a kind of concept that shows a, na a real need on one hand but on the other hand it has a era of origin that to suppose that this real new real need would be accomplished within the realm of capitalism now, the second point that I would like to bring to this discussion about qualitative growth is a discussion that usually shows up about the needs. And here generally it is shown that much of our production and of our consumption is of uh, useless things. It's of gadgets or yeah, unuseful things that will not need new reads. And supposedly these could be eliminated, these trinkets, and they could be eliminated without great disruption within still the capitalist system. And the critique that I could make or that I could propose to this kind of conception is that the notion of need implied here is a notion that is an abstract notion, a historic either uh, and or is a is is a way to show need the qualitative aspect the value the use value so this is a concept that discusses what is necessary or not what is superfluous or not from the viewpoint of human life and the quality and the well-being of the human life but this is not the notion of needs that presides the metabolism of our society. It is what is necessary in this society, above all, is what serves the valuation requirements of capital. And the need from the use value is something that is absolutely secondary. And so it, it is within this, the trinkets, and the things that are disposable, that don't last long, and the things that apparently are superfluous, these are actual needs in the capitalist society. The metabolism of capital cannot give up this kind of production, of this kind of consumption, even though we can acknowledge that this kind of production and this kind of consumption should be eliminated very quickly and absolutely. It's not simply an issue, a moral issue of bad people 
that push these things to the marketplace to benefit themselves, to become billionaires. No, it's not that only. What it what we're dealing here is that the dynamics of the reproduction of this society needs to feed itself, to keep itself, to sustain it, this kind of consumption that is destructive and superfluous and apparently unnecessary. Therefore, this expectation of a conscious control of the production of consumption actually only opens a feasibility in a revolutionary transition process. That is, as long as we're not, we don't prove ourselves capable of starting this process of overcoming capitalism, the consumption society will remain as something that is not brought, out, brought about. Now, going on to the second point, the inequality, this is a very sensitive point because what happens when we dive deep into what the science of climate science can offer to us, it is very rapidly evident that we must step back rapidly abruptly and preferably in a planned manner. So reverse the scale of our impact. And to do that, we must reverse or step back with in the scale of our activities also. Facing such a requirement or a task, a question comes up, what will happen with the nations that are at the periphery of the planet that live, survive, and reproduce in material conditions that are much lower than the high standards that humanity has already reached, although only a restricted group of it. So you have to work out this scale and that would imply in condemning these marginal or peripheral nations into extreme material poverty. And facing this question, we have some answers that sound completely wrong from the Marxist perspective. The first one, which I would mention, which is weaker than the second, is proposes that economic development requires first and foremost to solve all social problems so that then we could dedicate ourselves to solve the ecological issues and environmental problems, our material impact on our planet. And this kind of concept runs into a first problem, which is that it completely does away with any debate or mobilization around any environmental issues. And on the other hand, it also seems to assume that the economic development of a peripheral nation would not produce by magic an acceleration of the destructive ecological destructive processes that we already face. Now, this, in my view, is not the kind of the, the more dominant response or answer. The prevailing answer to that question defends or advocates the possibility of keeping open the economic development of the peripheral nations at the same time in which, according to plans and coordination, we would have an economic degrowth 
of the more prominent nations, the central nations. And this gives origin to two problems. The first one is that this kind of, this concept much assume that somehow the central nations would be convinced to follow that path. And the central nations would be convinced to contract their own standards, material standards of life, so that there would be a possibility for the peripheral nations to rise in their material access to the socially produced wealth. But there is an even worse problem, the second one, which is the following. Even if we admitted the possibility of convincing those nations, the idea of a growth combined to a degrowth would lose sight of the nature of capitalist development itself. Capitalist development does not produce this structure, central and peripheral nations by accident. It does not produce this structure because it ran out of its normal course. It is not an atypical reality of the development of capitalism that would be corrected if there were sufficient popular pressure or a scientific consensus. Capitalist development produces material wealth and also material poverty. Capitalist development in its own nature produces the reality which that concept intended to overcome, which is the reality of the social problems, the insufficiency of well-being, etc. And to close this part, even if we did admit that this kind of development that would produce to global equality, even if we admitted that this would be possible, and even if we admit that it is desirable and preserves the nature of capital, even though science tells us that there is no time for that anymore. The very rare processes of the rise of nations in the global hierarchy and the international division of labor, the very rare cases took decades to happen. And we don't have decades. It is not at our reach to decide between material loss and material wealth as hard as it is to admit it. The actual alternative that we face is between this reversal, a planned reversal of humanity in parallel or, or within a revolutionary transition, or the other option is that we will disappear from Earth. So in this sense, the solution to the social problems goes beyond capitalism. Uh, they become possible in an area that is beyond the, so, the capitalist society, such as happens with the environmental problems. And my third point, finally, is energy transition. This is a more sensitive issue because it is not as problematic as the other two points that I mentioned. So I have to be very cautious here because we have uh, companions that are highly qualified and who are uh, involved and engaged in this debate about the energy transition. What I mean to do here is simply to point out some problems that in my judgment are decisive. So again, 
o melhor que a ciência tem the best what, what science can offer us today tells us that decarbonizing our way of life or this reversal, as I said, is not only necessary, but very urgent. And there are some means through which we can operate this decarbonization process. The first one would be related to the scale of our activities. So we have the pattern of our emissions of greenhouse gases is strongly related to how we produce, distribute, and consume energy. Our energy consumption, on the one hand, occurs at a growing scale, and on the other hand, it is strongly based on fossil fuels, which produce much higher emissions. So having said that, one of the possibilities of thinking about an accelerated decarbonization would be an accelerated contraction in the scale with which we consume energy. Given any composition of our energy matrix, if we consume energy at a much smaller scale, obviously we will emit much less greenhouse gases. Now, please observe that this path has been blocked in the capitalist society. The contraction of the scale of our activities is simply impossible and inconceivable in the capitalist society because it conflicts directly with the uh, rationale of expansive capital. A society structured around the dynamics of capital is always thirsty, increasingly thirsty for abundant and cheap energy and in greater and greater volumes. So the reversing the scale is a path that we should take, but which is simply blocked to us. And even in the eco-socialist concepts in general, we lose this from sight because it is so typical for us to project the revolution to an undetermined future, it is so common for us to look at our present reality and not find the conditions that would be clear to unblock or unleash a revolutionary process. And when we launch the possibility of a undetermined future revolution, we are forced to think about what we can do today while we are still living within the structure, the framework of the capitalist society. And if our reflection is strictly within this area, then we have some alternatives, but they simply don't exist. They would be increased energy efficiency, which supposedly would reduce our consumption of energy and a reconfiguration of our energy matrix so that it is not so heavily dependent on fossil fuels and more dependent on renewables, which emit less greenhouse gases. Now, it is possible to resort to the ecological crisis made by Marxism to capitalism to show that the expectation around this efficiency does not have a base 
the expectation that efficiency will reduce our consumption of energy is systematically frustrated. Professor Foster discusses this well, when he discussed his paradox. I discuss it when I talk about the release of capital. Increased efficiency releases more capital. The capital cannot be accommodated. It needs to find more space to uh, expand its rationale or to execute the expansion of its rationale. And even though it does not do this directly but with, and with mediation, when it does it, necessarily it uh, replenishes that demand for energy that had been spared by a gain in efficiency. On the other hand, about the energy matrix, it somehow blinds our perception to the aspect of scale because the energy matrix positions our discussion relatively in relative terms. That is, a cleaner energy matrix uses so much percent less fossil fuels and so many more percent of renewables. But it does not inform us in which scale these energies are being consumed. So I worked out a small exercise with data from the International Energy Agency to provoke you. So let's think the following. In 1971, 87% of the primary uh, offer of fuel came from fossil fuels and 30% or 20% or 13%, I'm sorry, from biomass or renewables. From 1970 until 2017, which is the last year for which we have data, the energy matrix fluctuated until we arrived at the following relationship. So 81.9% of fossil fuels and 13.8% of renewables. So right away, we see that all of this spectacular progress we made since from 1970 to 2017 uh, brought a very small increase in the use of renewables from 13% to 13.8%. The reversal of fossil fuels was a little bit higher because it was replaced with nuclear energy. But the share of fossil fuels in the matrix of 1970 is greater than in 2017. But I prefer the matrix back from 1970 because in 1970, we consumed 2.5 times less fossil fuels. And for global emissions, this is a decisive fact. So the data from the energy matrix gives us important information, but it also leaves some very important facts out. Another thing, if we get all our offer of renewables from 2017, it would be capable of covering the demand for energy from 1970 by only 35%. So it would cover only 35% of that need. What we have today, it would not be even half of the scale of what we used 50 years ago in 1971. So it is no longer possible to say that our field of critique should continue to turn its eyes away to the, to the aspect of scale and bet all our coins in energy transition because energy transition is simply not occurring. We are simply stacking up energy that would be supposedly clean on top of that dirty energy. 
clean energy is not replacing the dirty energy. Dirty energy continues to grow even faster than the renewables or the clean energy are growing. And this is what we have to face. And we cannot face that without an, a revolutionary process. Why? Because it's not that it, it's not growing because of lack of political will or because the world is populated by bastards, although it is to a certain extent. It is growing because this feverish system is entirely dependent on increasing volumes of abundant cheap energy. And this is still provided by fossil fuels. And to conclude, I am certain that this does raise many questions to those who are listening, because what I did ultimately was say that a series of paths that seemed open for us, a series of paths that seem to be uh, to bring immediate results are actually all blocked. It's not that we don't know what to do, and it's not that we don't have the technical capacity to do it. It's just that doing it would imply in colliding so strongly with the capital dynamics that it would be impossible. So we cannot do that from within this society. So what I'm saying, in other words, is that to uh, unblock uh, this path that we have to follow has as an assumption the overthrow of this society. It's not that the revolution will solve all our problems, but it will unblock, unlock uh, and uh, to the, what is blocking our access and what do we have to do? And I'm not talking about the grandeur, the great things of the extraordinary uh, uh, task that you have to do. I'm talking about a minimum that is reasonable. Could you imagine that now talking about what is uh, reasonably minimal? In this society, we cannot not even stop to produce and consume in a crazy way trinkets that are useless, not even that we can stop. Not even this result, this society can allow. This would be uh, fatal uh, for capital. So we cannot manage even to uh, get out of an energy crisis, uh, clean energy, for decades of success in terms of our capacity to generate uh, energy through renewable sources has meant nothing in terms to clean the energy matrix in the last 30 years. The share of fossil fuel has increased vis-a-vis -vis the share of renewable sources of fuel. In absolute terms, the supply of energy from coal, gas, and oil has grown more in the last 30 years than what uh, we had in terms of absolute at, in terms of renewable source of, of fuel, uh, it comes in fourth in the ranking, uh, 10 times less than that is uh, than compared to oil, which is the third in the ranking. So not even these results that are relatively modest that we call a re minimally reasonable or allowable in, in this society. And that's why I say and sometimes this could seem a certain revolutionism that it could be called uh, childish but what i have been saying is that the revolution it has to have a minimum program because it is the one that can open the paths that are locked now where there are these barriers or where it's blocked and we have to have the courage to admit that that we cannot i'm now reaching the end of my presentation uh, we cannot hide behind the comfort of that famous mantra that says, 
the cynicism of reason and the will of and the optimism of the will and to, to treat these things that are non-associated well the will needs to be something that is directed to the real possibilities if the will is directed towards uh, possibilities that are illusional or lack of possibility it, it doesn't matter if it's optimistic or pessimistic the will will be accomplished if it is directed to actual possibilities and for us for this task that we face it, it doesn't matter if that will could be accomplished it has to be accomplished and with that depends our survival on human uh, uh, the humanity in the on in earth and so the reason it doesn't matter if it's pessimistic or optimistic the reason has to be at the service of the will and it's by reasoning that we can by the reason that we can uh, listen to reality that we can probe reality and understand what are the actual possibilities and what are the possibilities for, of illusion in terms of it's through the reason that we can visualize actual means and non-efficient means uh, efficient means and non-efficient means and so i believe i i said that this motto is uh, we should not hide behind this motto man when to surrender to what is only possible in the immediate situation but it is not useful for the task that we have ahead so this formula of pessimism of reason and optimism of the will has to be read under a different registration that we should be launched to the struggle we have to be launched with all the energy and even in our despair to accomplish what we need to accomplish i close with that thank you very much thank you eduardo we've seen we saw you talk with you many times but always you bring surprises to us you bring something new and this talk of yours now was a very impacting uh, talk for opening session which combines with our dear uh, John Bellamy Foster did before you I'll call now Poliana Labri she will coordinate the panel and I we I can must say that we receive an avalanche of questions in this session and Poliana will gather some of these questions and she'll make a selection and for those that are more representative and uh, uh, two other questions we don't have an infinite session we have li li time frame limits so Poliana has the has the floor uh, good evening to all first of all I'd like to thank very much to everybody that helped to organize this event and also to the speakers and everybody that sent their questions for this first block of questions it will have five questions the two first ones are directed to professor foster and then we'll have questions uh, other questions and then a question to eduardo and we also like to make an announcement that we'll close the speakers list to the end of the reading of these questions and so for those that still may wish to make a question you can still do it very well i'm going to start here with one question from professor virginia fontes she asked professor foster the following the definition of proletarian is linked to the separation of the means of production and due to the need of to sell the labor force <coughs> it's not only economic although it involves the economy how can we define the environmental proletarian the second question is comes from pablo pereira and he says the following yes she was reading very fast did you manage to get the first question professor foster yes okay no it's not it's okay it's okay 
Now the second question coming from Pablo Pedir. Uh, Marx ecology, uh, nature and materialism, you, in your text you say the following, quote, the legacy of Lukacs and Gramsci had been internalized and denied the possibility to apply nature in the dialogic mode of thought and given in essence all this realm to positivism, end of quote. So I'd like to, for you to comment the limits of dialectics in Lukacs and Gramsci. What is the road for uh, dialectics of nature? <laughs> now the questions comes from Cynthia that was directed to both uh, speakers. According to a, a news article of 16th of June of 2021, the landless workers movement wants to capture, open quote, 17.5 million offering uh, agribusiness deems with a return on investment of 5% per year. It's failing, she's failing. I'm sorry, we can't hear her. It was frozen, the image. Although these are funds to finance their production, but this follows the marketplace uh, rationale. So my, the question is the following. How can this can contribute to the struggle to overcome capitalism? Is it possible to sus have sustainable economy uh, within capitalism? How do you assess this movement? Now we're going to the next question from Eric. Also forward to the two speakers and she has the following. The economic crisis and capital accumulation and growing poverty, material and spiritual and unequal, uneven development. And so with this scenario, you can add up the environmental destruction, the concept of uh, a destructive force that will lead to barbarism uh, reinforces the ideology of extreme right. And so to close this block, another question that was made to Eduardo, which is the following. What is the critique about the decarbonization anti-productivism that is uh, uh, proposed by some Marxist virtues. So we close the first block of questions and and so we'll give you the time for the two professors to answer and we, just to remind you that we close the time for the speakers list. Thank you very much. Thank you, Poliana. Before we give the floor to John, I would just like to recall that we're going to change the language into English. So for those that are following the audio, you have to change now into Portuguese. And to John, I see that I muted your microphone. So when you come back, please open your microphone, which is closed now. And then Eduardo, the same thing. So thank you very much, John. You have the floor. Well, in terms of um, defining the environmental proletariat, um, in a sense, the proletariat was always an environmental proletariat in Marxian theory. What we, we did was overemphasize uh, the economic aspect or a, a, a narrow economic aspect. So the proletariat came to be seen as an industrial proletariat in the cities primarily in terms of economic factors, um, the um, uh, position within the factory, struggles over wages, and so on. Uh, and um, this was not actually the way that Marx and Engels developed in the, uh, the, their analysis in the first place. The proletariat was defined uh, by separation from the earth, from the land, which immediately put it in an environmental context. Uh, it's. It was simply. It was the the um, the um, enclosing of the commons, for example, was crucial to the formation of the proletariat. But that was uh, was an environmental issue from the start. Uh, so, and if you look at Engels's uh, condition of the English working class, you find that he was mostly about environmental issues. Um, it was about the factories, but it was also about people's, um, it was about the air quality, the water quality, um, housing, people's living conditions, uh, disease, epidemiology, all of these things were part of the original conception of the proletariat. Proletariat was seen as dehumanized, as removed from air, from water, um, as well as control over work. 
And what we did was, um, in the course of, of Marxist theory and the socialist movement, uh, all of those uh, environmental aspects were removed from the analysis, and we need to put them back. Uh, so it's not so much that the um, that there's this, you know, we can talk about the environmental proletariat. I think that's meaningful, but in a some in some ways it's a correction. It's going back to what the proletariat um, meant for Marx and Engels, which included both environmental and economic factors. In terms of the issue of um, the quote um, um, with respect to Lukács and Gramsci, it, it all has to do with uh, the dialectics of nature and and um, the rejection of of the dialectics of nature within within Western Marxism, uh, the Western Marxist tradition, as we call it, uh, which um, uh, ended up having all sorts of contradictory results. And in fact, Marxists moved away from dealing with nature at all, um, from dealing with the environment, and that has had um, tragic aspects. The truth is that. Um, Lukács never fully rejected, never rejected the dialectics of nature to the extent that that um, is said based on the, the one footnote two in 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 uh, the first chapter of uh, history and class consciousness. He didn't he didn't uh, completely abandon the dialectics of nature. And later on in his later work, um, he's um, concerned with reestablishing this based on Marx's theory of metabolism. But Western Marxism in general, uh, um, the, the tradition that that seemed that um, claimed to be coming out of uh, Lukács' history and class consciousness, uh, threw out um, um, all notions of the dialectics of nature, with with um, with um, the result that was a major split with uh, intellectual split within Marxism, which um, uh, and and uh, a tendency to a move away from any kind of, of genuine materialist conceptions within Marxism, it tended to uh, lead to um, a disenchantment with science um, altogether, um, not simply a critique of science, but an abandonment of natural science within Marxism. So this is the problem that we have to deal with in order to reconstruct um, Marxist ecology. We, we had to go back and put the put nature back into the analysis um and um my my book the return of nature uh is all about how that was done within marx's theory af after marx um up until um the 1960s 1970s the fight to to uh, bring nature back into the analysis uh in terms of the um the issue of, I couldn't get the whole question on the landless workers movement, but I did think, I do think I got the, the really important part of the question was that how can such strategy, strategies be, be sustained uh, within capitalism? And I think there's a problem here that um, we, we tend to think of capitalism not as a process or not as a system of accumulation, but as really as an all encompassing system in which we live and that we can't do anything um, revolutionary while we exist in capitalism. Somehow we got to overthrow the whole system uh, and then we can apply an ecological uh, strategy. Um, that isn't uh, isn't rational and and uh, it isn't strategically viable and it's a misunderstanding of 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 capitalism. It's probably better to think in terms of this uh, von Mises's uh, notion of of uh, his critique of capital, which really, which really goes back to Marx. Marx never really talked about capitalism. He only talked about capital. Capital is a social relation. But within the complex of this capitalist social relations, uh, we can we can carry out revolutionary transitions, which means what? Going against the logic of capitalism. And we have to do that fast now because we don't have very much time, which was what Eduardo was talking about. So I think what Eduardo was talking about is a revolutionary transition that doesn't isn't in the future that one that we begin to carry out now 
by going against the, the logic of capitalism. I would interpret it that way. I would say the MST is doing that. And when you think of the timeline, you think, well, we have like nine years to uh, reduce uh, global carbon emissions by 50% and um, what, um, 19 years to reduce them, um, what is it, uh, or we, we, in time, we, by 2050, we have to hit net zero carbon emissions, which basically means zero carbon emissions because the, the, um, the notion that we can have negative emissions, you just don't have the technologies at scale to do that. And it's not, it's not gonna be viable in, in the near future. So we, we're running up against a very um, extreme timeline. I mean, just think about it. In one generation, we have to uh, eliminate fossil fuels altogether. And we have to do this uh, for the survival of humanity. If you look at the scenarios that the, the IPCC re, uh, released last week, um, there, is, there are five scenarios, but one, only one really um, um, allows for, for uh, survival of, of, uh, of uh, civilization uh, in, in any kind of reasonable sense. And that's the first one. And that means we have to, somehow uh, keep um, the temperature from rising more than 1.5 degrees or um, keep it from rising 1.5 degrees. We have to be able to stabilize it that at that level or at, and at 350 parts per million in the atmosphere. And we have a very short window in which we can do this. It requires action that's revolutionary and it has to occur within the capitalist system, because that's where we're living. This is the system that we operate in. Somehow we have to generate within capitalism, within or, or in relation to the capital, uh, the logic of capital, we have to generate a counter logic um, that goes against um, the logic of accumulation, the logic of fossil fuels and so on just to uh, survive. And that's only with respect to climate change. There's all the other problems. Uh, there's um, species extinction. There's loss of, uh, of ground cover. It's not like the, the climate is, is um, destroying the Amazon at, at this point. It's people, it's, the, it's capitalism is directly destroying the Amazon. So we have to create a counter logic within the system that's revolutionary transition right now and um, yeah, anything that we do that uh, represents a fundamental um, um, logic that runs against the logic of capitalism, that is in by definition revolutionary today. And that's what we have to push. Um, I, I wish I could elaborate this uh, more fully, but in my analysis, I've said, look, there's two stages. We need a kind of an eco-democratic stage that um, is revolutionary. That's um, that us eco-socialists can lead in uh, at this stage where we we take those actions we take actions that are possible now simply for the sake of survival, but we need a, a bigger eco -so full eco-socialist revolution, a full socialist revolution in the future if, if humanity is going to survive because it's not just about climate change, it's about um, our relation to the earth in general, our relation to production. And um, I think this is, is um, I think Eduardo actually expressed this really well. I'm just trying to, to add something to the logic of what I think he was saying. Thank you, John. I'm going to move back to Portuguese so, uh, so that the translators can go with me into English. Uh, Edu, so, Eduardo, may we go to your questions? Yes, I got three questions asked to me. And the first one from Cynthia. This is a very emblematic case and I wasn't very much up to date with that. I will have to work with what you 
narrated in your question. But it's a very emblematic case of what I have been discussing in other opportunities, not today, which is that there is, within the rationale of capital, there is a mechanism that neutralizes our successes. It is something blind. It's not a monster or an alien that is operating it, but it's a blind mechanism. And it has to do with this impossibility to to expand capital. And in the end of your question, you ask whether this somehow contributes to the fight against capitalism. Of course, I am reading the question under the light of ecological concerns. So my thoughts would be as follows. If this kind of practice is successful in obtaining results that would moderate the material impact of agriculture, for example, since capital is being released in that area, it, this capital is not and cannot be counted. Only the extinction of that capital would preserve the result and bring about material moderation. But that capital cannot be extinguished. So it will necessarily need to migrate or find new opportunities to carry out its expansionist rationale, even if it's in the sphere of financial valuation. Now, it's also very common or typical to see the, the headlines of the news, which is uh, people get the money for the deeds. And it is very common of us to carry out moral critiques to these practices. But then I do agree with Professor Foster. I mean, engaging and contacting with the capital rationale in a capitalist society is something that you cannot escape from. And in this regard, I would not call upon this some kind of moral critique that the landless movement or any other individual or group would need to abstain from taking certain measures to ensure their own preservation or their own growth. But I think there is something more interesting that we can take out of these situations. Let's think about the following. The landless, landless movement, MST, under many, many aspects, is a virtuous experience with regards to the left, our intentions, our ambitions, and how we think life should be. So in many aspects, it was successful or it is successful, but this society follows such a prevailing and, and estranged rationale, using a more philosophical term, that it even converts the aspects that could be successful in our mobilization, in our choices, into vicious aspects and not virtuous. Let me use a different example, a simplified one to illustrate what I am saying. Recently, my um, companion bought a vegan butter and we know that there are many things that under the vegan diet that are absolutely necessary. And then if you look at the ingredients of that butter, 
you don't see any animal substance, but the first ingredient is palm oil. Next Thursday, or tomorrow, rather, with Sabrina, we will hear a Swedish biologist, Andreas Malm, who shows in one of his recent books that the devastation of tropical forests in Southeast Asia are driven by the monoculture of palm oil. So even initiatives and experiences that are successful and could mean small advances are converted into failures. So this intuition is added to what I tried to present here today. Now, Ellen's question, I have been lucky because last Sunday, the same question was asked and I was talking to João about it and João gave me a, the key to answer this in a very brief and correct manner, which is we are facing a very material and feasible alternative, even probable, of the disappearance of a significant share of the human population from the planet. The process of climate crisis, which is already ongoing and which will certainly become stronger until the end of our lives, will in many ways make the large urban agglomerations and large populations that will that we have today something unfeasible and it will lead to many deaths massive deaths chasing this prognosis which is more or less certain that is given to us by science it is not absurd to imagine that knowing that the more powerful groups in our society will somehow instrumentalize movements like the extreme rightist recently that we have observed, encouraging them propagating them and using them to ensure that as long as our, that while our ship sinks, they will get the first rescue boats. So just like the prognosis of crisis, emergency and collapse is feasible and even probable, this prognosis is also feasible and probable, at least in my view. And this gives us an additional task, because if it will happen, then we must be prepared. That is, we must be in the conditions to offer a reply, a response to this kind of attack that will certainly become more intense. If accelerated decarbonization is going to happen, but it will not happen in the necessary scale and time, then we must use this scenario of collapse and social crisis, then we need to include this scenario in the list of possibilities that we have to get prepared for. And the third question by Livia was very uh, summarized. Usually we like this, but I felt I missed some elements. So I will have to uh, infer what she means in her question. I think there is a certain share of Marxism that does make a critique, which I think is very naive to what is being discussed in the eco-socialist field. And it is naive 
because it follows the line of that second point that I brought in my in my presentation that supposedly we would need to solve all the social issues before we could even stop and think about giving or, or responding to the climate problems. So if we had a very, very long time, indefinite time, to bring the responses to the climate problems, then these ideas could be discussed more seriously. But given that our time, this kind of concept efforts and criticizes the degrowth proposals and makes these critiques based on the industrialist, developmentalist conceptions, this is nothing but a form of denial. It's not leading to what science gives us that is, the knowledge and the prognosis that science has been giving us. So it is a concept that is totally detached from the natural actual processes that are already underway and their trends. This alternative is conceivable in terms of the imagination that is, we should first develop and then pay attention to the ecological problems. You can even say that, but it is no longer a realistic possibility that we need to transform. Thank you, Eduardo. I will call Poliana again, who will give us another block, or our last block of questions. I know this is, is very tiresome from, for everyone, so we will have only one more block, and then the professors will provide their answers. So let us begin with question number one for Eduardo, and then one question for Professor Foster, and the third question for both of you. So the first question for Eduardo is from Luis Augusto Campos. Considering the points analyzed by you, uh, do the my question is the following. Ergometric data shows that a possible green economy, as was uh, suggested in uh, the Eco Summit, would, considering the rationale of the present thought of society, would that really be possible? Now, a question from Bob Pablo Pereira. Given the urgency of the changes or revolution, how could we operate, mobilize, and create practical measures for this to happen? And now, Andre Ferreira's question. How is ecology proposed by the developed countries uh, against the underdeveloped countries in the capitalist market. With the proposal of Tesla to bring about electric cars, why will this not solve the environmental problems? And a question from Diego. I would like you to explain better the idea of climate crisis and how it can be related to a structural crisis of capital. Now a question for Professor Foster that was asked by Gabrielle Pereira. My question is about something that Professor Foster 
uh, mentioned in several moments of his presentation, including the end. The relationship between the fights of the original peoples and the active theoretical practice and revolutionary practice of Marxism. Under this light, my question is, what must the Marxist revolutionary process, and especially the one of a Marxism that would be capable of answering the ecological threats brought by capitalism, how can we learn from the indigenous peoples? And now questions for both speakers. one from Juan Pena. If we understand the trend of capital and accumulation to the infinite, and as a counter trend, we have a crisis that brings to itself a very a strong drop in rates, wouldn't the environmental crisis also be a counter trend? This shows the lack of a theoretical basis for the social relations that involve nature in a more explicit manner and which enables us to see the environmental crisis as a counter power. Wow. These were the questions of the second block and I would like to thank all those who submitted their questions. I will give the floor to Professor Eduardo first. Or should we start with John? Yes, we could. Okay, so beginning this time with Eduardo. I missed the name of the person who asked the question about ecological imperialism. It was the third question. Andrea, Andrea Ferreira. So I will answer them in order. I thought there were three questions, a total of three questions, and then suddenly you read three questions that were only to me. So let's see what I could understand from them, beginning with Luis Augusto. What I believe is very symptomatic in this question and this is very typical. It is something I would actually like to talk about. And at the end of the question, Louise raises the following point. With the current rationale, would it be possible to operate changes that would bring uh, losses for the GDP? I would like to counter this idea because the problem, in fact, or maybe the first original one, because the rationale of thought is also a problem, but the first problem of the fact is not exactly how people think, although how people think is also a problem. The predominant rationale is a rationale that is concerned with growth and it is one that rejects degrowth. It sees with concern uh, events of degrowth, which it calls crises. We think in this manner because the reality of capital and the rationale of capital follows this nature and it demands this kind of subjectiveness from us, subjectivity from us. That is, the world is not like this because we think this manner. Actually, it's the other way around. We, our, this rationale prevails among us because, of course, there are other rationales. And you have the rationale that counters this, but the prevailing rationale is driven to growth because this society is driven to growth. So if people somehow convinced themselves of a different need, 
Even so, the social dynamic would be uh, would demand from them conduct and behaviors that would bring about growth. And I'm sure that all of us who are here have experienced this intimately. That is, you have to adopt certain conducts and behaviors that are, are against what you believe in or what you think or the idea that you are convinced about. So the drop of the GDP or sacrificing the GDP, the gross, gross national product, is not accepted with regards to because, because it wouldn't reproduce our society. But if you open a chance for something like a planned growth, we would have to challenge the more basic structures of this society. <laughs> and then Pablo makes the question, asks the question that is decisive one. How can you operational, operationalize the revolution? And uh, I'm going to bypass that, not actually usually you bypass this question, but nevertheless, I think the following, we have a time that is dramatically a short one. I do not buy the idea that there's no revolutionary energy that could be unleashed uh, at any time, I don't buy this idea. I think that it may exist, but it's balding uh, below the surface. But even if we had unleashed a global revolution, very well succeeded today, nevertheless, probably there would be not sufficient time for us to operate all the transformations that are necessary to avoid the worst risks and impacts of the climate breakdown. So if we admit that as a possibility, uh, a strong possibility, so we need to formulate the following question. What will happen then? What are the trends if we fail? and even in terms of speed, deepness, as to what we need to do. And so what will happen? And unfold events that are quite predictable vis-a-vis -vis the impact, climate impact that are predictable, that already are happening, and that will multiply themselves and combine and intensify we can say, for example, that the creation of non-inhabited uh, regions of the planets where we have enormous groups of population. So the mass migration will happen, and that's not out of the scope of possibilities. How will the revolutionary field prepare itself for that? Or we're going to be caught by surprise with this mass migration movements? And these are these certain impacts that are related to dry or, or, or hot waves or free or cold waves. We are facing a, a quite feasible possibility of a global crop breakdown, where a situation where we're going to have not only a relative scarce of food. Today, famine is produced by a relative scarcity of food. Uh, we we don't have uh, sufficient uh, food in certain points of the system, but we're facing the possibility of having insufficient food in absolute terms. How can the ruling class would react to an episode like this one? How the <clears throat> the working people, generally speaking, will respond to such a situation? We need not only to know what are the possible responses that we would give to a scenario like this one, but we have to have these answers and responses prepared, organized. So 
So when I provoke our comrades to mobilize and to organize, it's obvious that I'm provoking having in mind a revolution because I believe we still need to fight for the world that we want to live on. But we also have to have an open space, open room for preparation for a probable world. We cannot be caught uh, uh, on guard uh, or, or by surprise. André made a question about ecological imperialism and mentions the electrification of the fleet of cars and so on and so forth. I think that in the, in the first analysis, uh, the answer to this question has a little has a to do with what I answered in the previous question. The figures that are in the power positions, they have a reasonable consciousness of what's going on and what tends to happen. And they are already mobilizing either individually, either in, uh, in the institutional polity of the bourgeois state, they, they have been mobilizing themselves to prepare for answers to what is going to happen. There's report from the intelligence US community that are presented to the Senate in the US that uh, you have public access to this kind of report. And, and then they compare different uh, probable impacts for which we are not dealing with them yet. Our field is still lacking behind uh, the, this challenge. So from the imperialism viewpoint, and when we think in geopolitics and wars, this is not also out of the scope. I've been saying it seems a little bit a conspiracy theory, but it's a reference that I've been making and uh, I'm that the obsession that Trump and Trumpism demonstrated with the physical border with Mexico, I think that it, this has a relationship with the fear of mass migration from Central America uh, towards the US. Because in a social breakdown scenario, controlling the borderline with intelligence, that will not be possible. You need physical control, you'll need physical barriers. But this is just one example that I'm giving that amongst many other examples that could be gathered of mobilizations that are being documented in the field that I could call the conservative field in a generic sense. There's another aspect that has an ideological dimension of the ecological, ecological imperialism that makes circulate an idea that the nations, the so-called developed nations are cleaner. For example, the carbon market, it is directed, at least the one that was conceived by the Kyoto Protocol, it is all uh, designed to create a stimulus for technology transfers, because supposedly the central countries, the developed countries, would use a clean technology that would allow them to have a smaller ecological, ecological impact. That's not true. Any comparison that you can make with the data available shows us that the impact of the so-called developed nations are higher than to compare to the nations in the periphery. Even in terms of the domain of ideology, you have this notion being operated within the imperialism. Well, there's two other questions I'll try to answer very quickly. The notion of climate crisis, I'll try to bypass this question to save time because I, I believe that everybody's tired and we still have the mini course. In the mini course, I'll deal with this issue with more time. And in case the person is not uh, uh, enrolled in the mini course, we'll leave it uh, in the YouTube. But basically, in one sentence, I could say that the ecological crisis, the climate crisis could be characterized by trends of instability that uh, threaten the reproduction of society and 
and the, the threat to the survival itself of the species of the human species. And this is this is what I mean with the ecological crisis or crisis or climate crisis. At least the way I use it, and to finalize Juan's question, if the environmental crisis could be a counter trend. I don't know if Professor Forster will agree with me, but maybe this shows up in a certain way. In the second contradiction of James O'Connor, the crisis, the ecological crisis, as a counter trend to capital, as a barrier to capital. But there, I would say in this case that the environmental destruction, Marx even has a sentence where he says, tropical climate is not the home of uh, that is excessively abundant is not as good to capital it's not the home of capital it feeds itself with the multiplying needs and so in this sense the destructive processes they present themselves in a shared way to capital they could be presented in fact as a counter trend that suddenly and makes it infeasible, unfeasible certain activities in terms of cost structure that is not feasible, or even it sweeps out that production base of that capital. But on the other hand, it presented itself as a paradise for creating new needs because in the crisis process, the ecological crisis process like this one, there's no question that the, the needs will multiply themselves and they will become more acute in such a way that they could not be satisfied these needs. But while we still have people here, and while we don't have destroyed capital's metabolism, capital could take advantage of these dramatic needs and tragic needs to profit, to persist in, uh, in its accumulation course. Well, that's it. I, I don't manage. I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not sure if I managed to answer all the questions. Thank you. That's what I managed. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Now let's go back for those that are watching in the original audio, and I'll switch, and I'll ask Professor John Bellamy Foster could now his, his final intervention here in our seminar. You have the floor, Professor. Well, I'm in. I'm in a rather embarrassing situation because I've spent um, 30 years dealing with these issues and all and um, all but one of the questions were directed at me and Edward, Eduardo's just answered about six questions. And um, it doesn't seem like, it seems like I'm supposed to make closing remarks at this point. And uh, so um, I, um, it's, it is a very embarrassing situation because I have, I have comments on all of these questions too, but I'm. Feel free to, feel free so to, uh, John, I, I feel, feel free to make comment. your comments, of course. You don't need um, to, to go straight well, to a single question. I don't think, um, I was asked the question of um, the relationship of, um, you know, how do you connect uh, Marxism to indigenous struggles, and um, I think that's a question of of, pra of uh, praxis. Um, Marxism isn't a fixed doctrine; it's um, it's engaged with vernacular revolutionary struggles that appear in different ways at different parts, um, different times, different parts of the world, and um, we have to learn from these struggles and from the changing conditions. And I think that there is, um, yeah, there is an overlap between uh, the struggles of Marxists, particularly eco-socialists and uh, those who are involved in indigenous struggles, uh, peasant movements, and so on. If we, if we are not part of those realities, those conditions on the ground, then, then uh, Marxism is, is useless. It has to relate to the um, the actual vernacular revolutionary traditions, and uh, so there, there's no um, there's no uh, definite answer to that because um, the it's the method that is important, and our method uh, requires us to deal with changing conditions and different movements. And uh, if we had more time, we could talk about the specifics of that. But I mean, you can go back in in Latin America. American history, as far as Meritegui, who was certainly um, 
bridged um, Marxism and uh, indigenous struggles in his own work. In terms of, um, of the um, question about um, uh, ecological imperialism, uh, I think what Eduardo said was very good, but um, I, I wrote a, a piece um, with uh, colleagues not long ago called um, Imperialism in the Anthropocene. And it is, there are strategies within the imperial core now in terms of, of uh, climate change and, and uh, the overall environmental problem. And there's a recognition that, that not only uh, for social and historical reasons, but also because of um, geographical reasons, uh, the, um, the global south is more endangered and um, uh, the low latitude regions are more endangered, at least immediately, by climate change. And that has been strategized and is being utilized in various ways to uh, justify um, a new kind of uh, ecological imperialism. I think we have to be aware of that. I'll give you an example in terms of the recent pan pandemic, um, foreign policy, the the, um, one of the two leading foreign policy journals in the United States uh, had a lead article in relation to COVID-19 that said that that um, said that um, hundreds of millions of people in the advanced ca uh, capitalist countries could die of the um, pandemic if that that, that enormous numbers of, of of people could know oh, tens of millions could die in the advanced capitalist countries of the pandemic if it was let loose if there was nothing done and they um and so it was necessary to to um uh, social distance and so on but then they said that in terms of the global south they shouldn't wear they shouldn't uh, um, uh, social distance, they shouldn't wear masks, that demographically there would be less people uh, dying. And, and basically, uh, the global south was needed to keep the world economy going. And uh, so it was it was a, a, a position that you avoid uh, deaths in the global north and you let deaths occur in the global south. But the same thing is happening with respect to climate change. We have to look at this, how... Um, how um, imperialism is entering into these things. I also want to make a point that, um, that um, you know, climate change is only a small part of the, the um, uh, planetary emergency. It's very important to understand. I mean, it's immediate. It's, it's extremely dangerous. We are approaching the importance of, of um, 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature increase or a two point um, um, a, a, a two point um, a Celsius temperature increase, which is now the backstop. The importance of these these um, boundaries is that they mark a point of return, no return. That especially with uh, if it reaches two degrees, the um, the uh, science says that it may be uncontrollable and irreversible. Um, that might be the case even with 1.5 degrees, but in two degrees, the science says it could become uncontrollable and irreversible. That is, it's no longer possible to get back to 350 parts per million um, at all, no matter what we do. And that's because all of the feedbacks would come into play and, um, and we would, and the climate could well spin out of control and head to three degree increase, four degree increase. This is important because science says that a four degree increase in global average temperature, uh, industrial civilization could not even exist, could not uh, survive. There could be no industrial civilization whatsoever. And we actually have that. That is a possibility in this century for people for and that younger people could face if we don't uh, do anything so this is very important and we have to avoid um breaking the climate budget because um we could reach this point of no return and this is uh this is why the un general secretary now says 
we should close all coal uh, coal plants, all coal fired plants, and cease building all pipelines on the, on the earth. This is the UN General Secretary who is taking a stronger stand than the environmental movement generally, or than than uh, Marxists for that matter. And, and doing it on ecological grounds and in terms of science without even bothering about the economics of it. Because if we destroy uh, humanity and the earth, there's no, um, you know, the economy doesn't uh, matter. So these, this is an issue, but climate change is only one part of the overall environmental problem. We have to understand it's much bigger than that. There are nine planetary boundaries uh, designated by science, and we're in the process of crossing all of them, and climate change is only one of them. Even if we were able to stop things with respect to climate change, there is still the problem of the other planetary boundaries, and the common denominator all of all of it is, is uh, the capitalist system, and as Eduardo has emphasized, um, he's emphasized that it's economic growth, but we should get away from calling it economic growth. And I think we should even get away from the, the notion of degrowth because when we the, the definition of economic growth is the one that is established by the capitalist system itself. So it means uh, GDP is defined according to um, the book, bookkeeping of the, of the capitalist system. It's um, and so growth has this. What it really means is the accumulation of capital. It's a it's a sort of economic bookkeeping that's organized around the accumulation of capital. What we need is a system that is geared to de de accumulation and towards uh, the restoration of of human and environmental conditions. They used to talk when we had the economic debates in the old days. They used to talk about the trickle down theory that the economic growth um, trickle down to the population. Nobody believes that anymore, but they want us to think that economic growth somehow trickles down with respect to environmental improvement. We have to stop believing that. Uh, the accumulation process is completely toxic in, in relation to uh, the environment. So we need um, a whole different kind of, of um, uh, eco-revolutionary movement, which I think uh, Eduardo has done a lot to um, to outline, and um, and it has to build fast. And I'm I'm you know I'm it's easy to be pessimistic, but I'm optimistic about one thing, and that is we're in such um, a deep crisis globally, a planetary emergency. There's a planetary crisis, and we're seeing extreme weather all over the globe. People are recognized. There's, they're experiencing this in their material conditions in their lives. And everyone in the world is basically talking about this now. And there are movements. There are movements of hundreds of millions of people fighting this. And there will be movements of billions of people. We don't know if that will be enough to win against the capitalist system. It depends on the quality of the movements and just how revolutionary they are. But the one thing we know is that humanity is not going to um, um, you know, uh, face extinction without a fight, that the population of, of uh, the earth will resist what this system is delivering. I don't really believe in, in, um, in a Connor's um, theory. I was part of those discussions in the beginning. There is no, um, what he, he uh, assumes is there's some sort of economic feedback mechanism within capitalism, which will save us. There isn't. Um, there's only us. There's only uh, people movements. There's only the struggle to save the planet, not on, on economic grounds, but, but because we need to do it for, for, um, for future generations. In fact, for present generations, um, we need to save the earth and save humanity and we'll work out our economic solutions in that context. But, but um, survival is, is the, the number one issue. And I think that's the only argument that we can really make. Um, it's the revolutionary argument. So I don't know, um, I, would, I would tend to um, 
deal with all of these questions in this way. We could um, talk about a lot of the specifics, but that's what it all really comes down to in the end. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, I'm going back to Portuguese to make my final uh, my final uh, speech. So. Very well. I imagine that we had a, a panel uh, roundtable that was very gratifying, full of content, with two major uh, uh, presentations and complimentary, I would say. And I would like to thank very much, first of all, to all that followed these uh, presentations, as are the team. The NIEP team is fully mobilized here, and we're working many different fronts at the same time to so that we can have a good chat room, a good broadcasting, streaming, emails coming and going. We had to, we had to coordinate all this, and that made it possible for us to be here discussing and talking about this issue that is such a difficult one. And of course, I would like to thank to my colleague, Poliana, that with very cool way manage the questions and finally the interpreters uh, team and uh, the interpretation team as i said at the beginning i left to the end of my uh, appreciation and thanks to the two members of the grand panel are great and dear eduardo saparreto and to our professor john bellamy foster who honored us with his patience and, and showing us all his knowledge. As I said in the very beginning, I would like to regret the fact that we do not have the possibility to unfold this uh, presentation and this round panel in a formal presentation where we can talk very easily because uh, although we do have time to extend more a little bit the, the discussion, although we do have that time to extend this, but I believe that we managed to reach what we intended to do, that is to have a great opening round table. And so with that, I close this session and send a great hug to our two brothers, two comrades. Usually we have at the end of the sessions, we're amongst the guests, but no, we can't even do that today because, especially to John, that is not here close to us. But once again, we'd like to leave our thanks, our acknowledgement. So I'd like to ask to our colleagues that are doing the streaming to close the streaming and I'll close here with the Zoom. So good evening to all of you and see you tomorrow, two o'clock in the afternoon with a new, with a course. Thank you very much. The session.